<laughs> All right, attention, attention. Yes, yes, yes. we're ready. Yes. Yes. All right, so uh, we'll get started, and I guess you can hear me a little bit. Mike yeah. yeah. Uh, well, welcome to the uh, Breaking into Comics and Surviving in Comics panel. Uh, my name is Heidi McDonald. I am the editor of hey. Hey. Here comes, here comes the guy. I have on my uh, site, I have a resource for people who want to break into comics because I'm always asked, how do you break into comics? Every panel I'm on always asks this. So I have on my site, on the front page, I have a little, uh, uh, you'll, you'll see a graphic that says how to break into comics and survive once you're there. So you go and it's a resource page of blog posts, uh, lists of books, websites, and I'm always adding to it. It's anytime I see something that really talks about getting into comics, you know, the, and then the art of surviving there, which is really, uh, you know, what ha well, where the real art is. And so, uh, you know, but it, I do have that resource, and if you have something you'd like to add, just email me. I like to say I'm constantly updating it. So, uh, anyway, but today we have four uh, amazing creators who will talk about their experiences and their advice, their wisdom, and share it with you. Um, so we'll just start, and uh, from the, the hallowed tradition of To My Right, we have uh, Carl Potts, who is the... Uh, Creator of many fine comics, uh, editor, long his long career as an editor, creator, and packager, and all, and, and also life after comics. He can tell, speak to that too, or life transitioning, the important transition. Um, next to him we have David Gallagher, who is the creator of Boy, a High Moon, and a writer, and uh, he has been breaking into comics for how long? <laughs> years? I don't know. Seventeen. Seventeen years, yeah. Uh, and next to him we have Jeff King, who struggled to break into comics after, uh, along with his very successful television writing career. So, uh, you know, he could really give us the other track. <laughs> and uh, finally on the far end we have Jamal Eigel, the creator of Mind Danger, uh, and the artist of many, many, many fine comics. So, uh, yeah, why don't we just, I'm just going to start, I, I, I did have on my slideshow little bullet points that would be used as a conversation starter, but I, I think I think I can remember what I said. Uh, but why don't you all just start and talk a little bit about about how you know you got your break. Talk about how you got your break. And so you know Carl, your obviously your career goes back a long way. It's a very different industry, but but how did you get your break? Um, like most people I was a, a fan of comics, wanted to create them, and I started out primarily as an artist. Um, and I got to know a couple of pros who were, I was originally from the, uh, the Bay Area in California and a couple of pros were living out there and I got to know them at the conventions and hit it off with them and they were nice enough to uh, have me over to their places and uh, look at the latest work I did and give me feedback. And eventually, uh, it was Jim Starlin and Alan Weiss. And, uh, oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, they needed to uh, do a favor for an editor at DC and basically draw, pencil a whole book over a long weekend and um, they, they asked me to uh, no come and help them. And I watched Jim Starlin sit on a sofa, watching TV, lay out 22 pages in a couple hours. And I thought, is this the industry standard? <laughs> <laughs> Feels like it sometimes. And then um, uh, Starlin Weiss did the tight pencils on all the major figures. And I worked on a lot of the secondary and background figures in the backgrounds. And that was my first. Uh, professional job and then I decided to move from the Bay Area to go to New York to try and break into the comics business on a full-time basis uh, very naively and uh, I didn't know anybody in New York had never moved away from home and I told Starlin this and he said well do you know anybody in New York and I said no and he goes let me make a couple of calls so he arranges for me to fly into New York and I spend my first week in New York crashing at an apartment shared by Walt Simonson and Al Milgram. <laughs> and they live in an apartment building uh, with Howard Chaykin and Bernie Wrightson, oh so I'm counting around with all these guys. Where was that? Four stills. Oh, wow. <laughs> there, should be, there should be a plaque in that building. <laughs> right. and, uh, and then Starlin uh, was visiting New York at the same time, too, to, to make one of his occasional visits back to New York to, to get work. And, he took me into the Marvel offices and introduced me to the person who was in charge of the British reprint department. And there they would, for the British market, they would chop all the 22 page stories in half. So the second halves would need splash pages. And they handed those out to the new guys that were struggling to break in. And I got a couple of those and uh, things kind of took off from there. And I didn't find out until years later that the only reason I got that assignment was that 
uh, the editor had kind of blackmailed Starlin. He took him aside and said, I'll give this kid some work if you do a cover for me. <laughs> and he did that, and he never told me. I had to learn about it from somebody else years mm -hmm. later. So I, I guess the, 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 the lesson learned there is that you not only have to have a certain level of talent and skills, but it's vital to have the relationships. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's going to be hard to top that story. Uh, but David, how, I can, I can what's your big break? Oh boy. Right. <laughs> well, I'm well, well, pressure on that. Done. 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 Yeah. No, no, not really. I can't really top it, but I can compliment that story. Um, so, uh, in undergrad, uh, my undergraduate degree was in neuroscience and education. I had no dreams of actually breaking into comics until I was in grad school and uh, decided to, like, what the hell, like, major in comics. So I went to Goddard College in Plainfield, Vermont, mm -hmm. and, like, created my own independent study. And during that process, I was like, you know what? I, I kind of want to work for Marvel Comics. So I drew a six-panel comic strip resume and faxed it to Marvel, and two days later, I was in New York working for Marvel Comics <laughs> as an intern. Um, so I worked for the interactive department uh, during... Uh, right when uh, Jimmy Palmiotti and Joe Casada were doing Marvel Knights. So I got to work on some of the very first digital comics Marvel ever created. I got to see how they made, were made and, and sort of integrate that into what I was doing and what I was learning about digital comics. And the people that I worked with there, um, Kwanzaa Johnson, John Cirilli, uh, Ron Peraza, they all eventually made their shifts to different aspects. Uh, some of them went to DC, where I worked with them uh, when they founded Zuda, which was DC Comics' web comics imprint. Some of them uh, went to different places, but ended up getting further in Marvel f as part of their interactive department, and then at the relationships <laughs> I built with them there ultimately led to me uh, working for both DC and Marvel as a writer, and then doing my own independent web comic stuff with the tools uh, that I learned there. So yeah, it's been really great for me um, because I've got to be on the pioneering aspect of a lot of cool stuff, either working with, um, like John Roberts, who I worked with at Comics I uh, worked with at Marvel, became the founder of Comics Allergy. So I got to do, um, you know, the first comic ever developed for the iPhone. You know, so it's really cool to have uh, those relationships and work with people um, who you, you, you sort of come up together and you're able to then parlay that into doing some just really fun, fascinating stuff. I'm also hearing a common thread of facility with technology. Mm. You know, using the facts, <laughs> understanding the, technology, <laughs> the iPhone. Is that part of it? Is yeah, that, yeah, some of that is. Fluency. Mm. No, no, no. Obviously, both these stories involve, you know, a gang of people, a gang of creators, or you know, a group of creators. Now, now, Jeff, I've heard it joked that it's e it's harder to break into writing comics than it is for it to break into writing TV. Um, and you know, your career t as a television writer, you know, I mean, you've been a showrunner. I mean, it's not like you've you know written the odd episode, so you're pretty well versed. Yeah. But how did you break into comics? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I broke into, com I was a TV and film writer first and uh, had produced and directed things. And uh, through, uh, because I was working here in New York, producing White Collar, uh, became friendly with uh, people who worked at Marvel. Not because they were in the comics field, but because we were fellow Canadians and friends of friends. <laughs> and uh -huh, and the so, Canadian connection. So, you, so you, now you, there's a, a Canadian thread that runs through this. And, 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 and while competitive during the week, on the weekends, everyone socializes together. And through that group, I met people who worked at DC. And uh, I wound up uh, on a tour of the DC offices and met uh, Jim Lee and Dan DiDio because I was talking about the TV shows that I worked on, and they were talking about comics, and as a kid, I was a huge comics fan, read them, loved them. I was a Marvel kid growing up for the most part, and the, the Claremont Burton years and Neil Adams. Uh, I knew who Batman and Superman were, but for whatever reason growing up, the comics that my parents bought me were the Forever People and the Metal Man and right. the Demon and the characters that were kind of outside of the Justice League and the mainstream. And so I think they thought that was kind of interesting or quaint or, mm -hmm. but I was, I knew those characters and we got to talking. And it, that evolved into a bit of a longer conversation that happened over a few days. They were working on this big event called Convergence. 
Dan Jurgens, Keith Giffen, Brian Azzarello, Jeff Lemire had all been involved up to that point, and Scott Lovedell was working on it. And um, they invited me to come in and be part of a pitch for a take on um, that story. And so um, it sounded a little bit to me like what happens when you're in a writer's room on a TV show where there are a lot of different viewpoints, a big story that's going on, a lot of characters, mm -hmm. tons of mythology, and I really didn't know how much mythology was going to be taking place in Convergence at the time. Uh, but I, they wanted to start with the Earth 2 characters coming out of World's End, and they wanted to finish with those characters going into a new uh, book. And so I uh, came in, pitched them a take, and they gave me the opportunity to work on Convergence with Jurgens and Scott. And um, so to go from a kid who loved comics growing up to uh, the opportunity to work at DC and work on an event like that was beyond <laughs> exciting to me. And I dove right into it. And as some of you who are, are familiar with it, a, a comic script and a TV script sort of look the same. Mm -hmm. There's action and there's dialogue and the format's a little bit different. But <laughs> The first comic script that I wrote, because it was in a hurry and the first issue needed to be done, um, I turned it in and sort of was thought that I had written something about the right length. And they sent it out to, to, for someone to break down. I think it was Darwin Cook or something, who said, who said, who is this idiot? He just, just wrote you a 200-page comic. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because uh, as a TV writer, you're going in and one line of action can be broken down to like 12 panels worth of material because you've got characters making multiple motions at the same time. Exactly, and that's exactly the, what I did, the, the primary rookie mistake. And so I had overwritten the action and, and was asking for, you know, an example somebody gave me was if, if it's about a drink of water, there's the impulse to pick up the bottle, there's the actual drink, there's the satisfying moment after where you're reflecting on how you taste it. And so as a you know, as a writer, you're trying to pick the right moment. But what I discovered is in a TV script, it's meant to be processed by a whole team. Mm -hmm. Production designers, cinematographer, director, and ultimately actors. But a comic script, the artist is all of those people. And so the artist is interpreting it from the viewpoint of composition of image, mm -hmm. picking, compressing the action down into exactly what that right moment is, um, and then choosing the sequence of images that are going to flow out the page. So I, I quickly learned uh, over time to, and I got, a, I got some good advice from people. Um, Christina Strain, who was a colorist, said to me one action or <laughs> Or extrapolate that to what one. Doing the flesh. Yeah. <laughs> so, so your 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 comics education has been really fresh and new. Yeah. <laughs> and On the fly. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. It, it was. It was a little bit like being dropped into a situation yeah. where you have to learn, but it was wonderful. And so, you know, Brian Azzarello said, "Type your dialogue in caps, so you see how much of the image would be covered by the dialogue." And um, it, slowly, I I have kind of come to. Um, seeing the difference between the two, so even though it looked the same starting out, it, they are profoundly different. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Jamal, your big break. Uh, my big, okay, well, uh, my, my first job in the industry was as a DC intern, and I, at the time, I don't even know if this program still exists, um, they used to, the yeah, board of New York Board of Ed used to have a program called uh, City of School Executive Internship Program, and uh, I did a six-month internship, which was me spending half my day in the production department with uh, Bob Rosakis and Fred Ruiz, and then the other half of the day, you know, breathing in chimney smoke in Andy Helper's office, <laughs> hanging out with him and Kyle, and Kyle Baker and Kevin McGuire. Yeah. And, the Mark last time you smoked inside and you yeah. yeah. You know, Andy, Andy would show, Andy Helfer would show up at like noon, leave at like 9 p.m. It would just be like, you know, music and smoke and people hanging out in his office. 
So that was like the beginning of my comics <laughs> education. But I, I actually ended up learning a lot, uh, especially at 17. I mean, you know, this was... Wow. I you started at 17? I started at 17. I, you know, I grew up loving comic books. I grew up loving superhero comics, um, particularly, you know, DC Comics, huge Superman fan. And um, out of that intro, I spent six, six months at DC, you know, as an internship, went back to school. A uh, couple of, flash forward, you know, a couple of years later, I, st I started pitching myself as an artist. I was working for this company called Majestic Entertainment, which was, you know, oh. 1993. It was one of the companies that were doing the collectible card comics. The company itself, folded within like a year and like filed chapter 11. The, the, uh, the parent company embezzled all the money from the company and took off of all the artwork and You're like- getting a real education. Yeah, exactly. Was like, it Dan Lawless doing work for this? Yeah, he was. Yeah, it was a him, it was, uh, you know, one of my first conventions was me at a booth signing like, a, the cover, they had taken a bunch of sketches of character designs and put it on this cover as a preview book. So it was me, Dan Lawless, Phil Hester, um, uh, Fred Schiller, uh, Marilyn Watt, you know, a bunch of other people. And, um, you know, they left me hanging. They, I, they, owed, they ended up owing me like $3,000 and my artwork had disappeared. But I had photocopies and I was scrambling for work. So I took, I made like 50 copies of everything that I had. I sent it out to everybody that I knew. And I got a call from Kevin Dooley, who used to be the editor on Green Lantern. And he needed somebody to do eight pages in six days. And that was my first published work was, uh, it was uh, Green Lantern 52, which was like right after Kyle Rayner became Green, like two issues after Kyle Rayner became Green Lantern. So that was my first, like, Break getting into comics. Now, staying in comics is completely it is. different. It is, it is very different. That's why it's like, you know, the survival skills. Um, uh, well, you know, it's interesting in you know, all these stories. There is, I always joke when people say, How do I break into comics? And I say, You just hang around long enough, and then somebody's going to say, Hey, you know what? Uh, why don't you do something? You know, and even, you know, like Jeff's story is literally that, that too. You know, I mean, everybody was just hanging out, and then you're, you're either, you know, Suffering uh, over the weekend, drawing, you know, <laughs> you know, just hanging out, smoking, and drawing comics. Um, what, uh, you know, I have so many, but you know, Carl, you were just bringing up something about making submissions, or you know, how yeah. I mean, can you? Because you became an editor. I right. mean, you've done, you've done it all. So when um, I remembered what it was like when I was trying to break in, and I'd send in my xeroxes of my pages, and I'd either never get a response, or ages later I'd get a form letter that told me absolutely nothing. <laughs> and when I was asked to be an editor at Marvel, I made a vow that every person who personally sent me a submission would get a timely response with some useful information. Oh, wow. And I ended up um, almost regretting that. I was <laughs> editing another couple of books because I got to be known as the editor to send your stuff to at Marvel. Mm. But my first day on the job, I was replacing somebody who was leaving staff to go freelance, and I inherited their big stack of submissions they hadn't gotten around to. The first day I'm going through them, and I find some guy named Art Adams. The first day on the job. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started working with Art, and I teamed him up with my assistant editor, and sent in a creative mog shot, and things were off and running. So I found that most of the art submissions have the same two or three major weaknesses, so I, I cobbled together a bunch of um, notes about uh, identifying the weakness and either having listing resources, usually book resources, that they could use to help people them up and sometimes drawing exercises. And I'd send them back to people because I felt that these are, you know, even if it was somebody sending them something of a stick figure that was obviously unusable, these are your, your most ardent fans. And it was, if nothing else, bad marketing to just let this stuff sit there. Right. And um, so, uh, over time, I, I found and developed a lot of top talent that way in looking at the portfolios at conventions. Uh, but it's still, I think, you know, that was fairly unusual. I think a lot of it mostly comes down to uh, making relationships in, in addition to having the, those skills that you need. Uh, even most people, like I'm a real introvert. I'm terrified up here right now. Uh, but you've got to, you know, put yourself out there a little bit and make connections. 
uh, and uh, that's what eventually helps open the doors and increase the skids for uh, getting in, I think, a lot. Uh, what, I, I was gonna, no, go ahead, no. And I think that, um, to that point, I think that you have to also do the work. Like, I think a lot of, uh, at least my experience, is that there are a lot of people who want to do it. There are a lot of people who want to break in and think that it's going to be like a super easy job. Oh my God, I totally want to do these things. But they don't necessarily take the necessary steps either A, to do the work required right. to be either a good artist or a good writer. And uh, like just following simple guidelines, whether it's like um, following the submission guidelines on any website. There's so many people who just can't follow simple directions. <laughs> um, so if a submission, if a company says include A, B, C, and D and sign this form and you don't do those things, you're not really taking this seriously. Right. The other, so there are people who don't follow directions and then uh, on the, the, the same side, there are people who are not willing to do the work. So you well, might I get think, an opportunity. I think in, in that idea, I mean, there's like, as creative people, we all have a certain amount of self-delusion. We, we, we all, you, you have to, in order to survive. Speak for yourself. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, uh, but you know, you know what I mean. You, you have to have, there's a certain amount of ego involved. There's a certain amount of self-delusion that you have. Just because you're putting yourself out there in front of the world, you're trying to share what you consider to be a, to a very personal part of yourself and commercialize it. That's ultimately what we're trying to do. Um, there's a certain point where self-delusion gets in the way of wanting to do the work. You know, thinking that the work should be easier and not realizing that it takes man hours to produce the work that we do. It doesn't, it, not just, it, it takes hours to practice writing. It takes hours, you, you know, right. if you're an actor, you have to act. You have to, whether it's commercials, you be on stage or whatever, with, you know, bit parts, whatever, whatever opportunities to be yeah. a comic book artist, you have to draw comics. And it doesn't, I've done, in my past, I have done some really, really bad, like stuff that, like mind-bogglingly bad assignments, like, because I knew I had to do it. Not just that I needed the money, but I needed the credit. I needed the, I needed the opportunity. I, I, even the bad assignments, I looked on as an opportunity to experiment, to change the world, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so ultimately, so the, the two things there, so getting back to my point, is that if you are able to show an editor that A, you can follow directions, and B, you can do the work and put in the effort, nine times out of 10, you're gonna be in a much better place because that shows that just those two simple things means that you might be hireable. Like, you might not have the talent, but if you can follow directions and are willing to get better and willing to do the work, that at least shows potential. And there are so many people who just can't follow those two things, so why should I even bother hiring you if you can't follow directions? Because what does that mean about your making deadlines or being reliable or being somebody that makes, like editors want to hire people that help them make, help them look good. And if you make them look bad, they're not going to hire you again. Professionalism is a big part of it. Uh, as an editor, if I, had a, if I was trying to figure out who to hire for a book and there was a group of people I was considering, in addition to the quality of their work and the suitability of the style, a big part of it would be the professionalism if they established themselves as being flakes that have to be chased down for the work. Oh my God. I would not, they could be brilliant. They could be you know, the equivalent of Michelangelo for comics, but if they can't uh, deliver the work uh, when they promise it, when, the, when it's due, then uh, I have no use for them. I'd rather work with someone who maybe doesn't quite have that talent level, but is willing to work with me to get better and is reliable. And, um, like you said, you know, the editors are looking for, for people to, to make their jobs easier, not harder. Yeah. And, uh, you know, occasionally I'd, I'd, I'd work with people and they were talented or whatever, but if they just, you know, were not professional, uh, I, I couldn't deal with them, I'd cut them loose. And by professional, I mean you have to not only consistently do uh, quality work, uh, you have to do it on the agreed upon deadline, 
Uh, you never take a job unless the editor or the art director tells you when it's due. And if you run into a problem en route to that deadline, you keep your editor informed before the fact not after the fact. You don't just let the deadline blow by and don't let them know that you've run into an issue or a problem. That's a sure way to cut your career short. Or to, yeah, to don't, it. don't lie about it either. No. Like, oh, that yeah. is absolutely... I, I, for a while, I was an editor at Random House working on Attack and Titan and Sailor Moon and a bunch of other things. And the people who would lie to me were the people I would never call back. And, but the people who delivered on that work, you know, I'd be sure to, like, hire them again, or even write them a recommendation on LinkedIn. I will do things for people who are willing to go that extra mile, people who lie about not making the deadlines. Even entertaining lies are, are not good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story to people with excuses. Yeah. Uh, I had one person who had like three or four grandmothers died over the course of I don't know how long, and then um, one guy uh, told me he was living in um, out in the desert in Arizona, and they don't have normal air conditioners out there. They're called swamp coolers or evaporators. Uh, and the only place that he had room for his drawing table apparently was right next to the, the blower for this thing. So he said he had a 30-mile-an-hour 30, 30 wind across his uh, drawing board all day long. By the time his brush, brush left the inkwell, it was dry before he, <laughs> he, he did no more work for me. Uh, That's a great story. That, yeah. that, is, yes. that is original. Yeah. I, that's, if you put very, that much creative, very creative and totally unusable. If you put that much creativity <laughs> into actually <laughs> work. The thing is, too, the guy was phenomenally talented. When I started working at Marvel, there were two people I was determined to help break their careers, and he was one of them, and he had to go out of his way to, to uh, you know, basically short-circuit. You know, I'm a former editor, and uh, I think we've all had that mm -hmm. experience, or, you know, as a, as a showrunner, as a, you know, it's, it's, uh, we've all had that person we thought was so brilliant, and we really cared about personally, and we really wanted to help them get there, and they just self-destructed themselves over and over again, so, yeah. you, you, you can't follow somebody who's carrying a blowtorch and burning the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> so don't be crazy, okay? Yeah. That's what we're saying. I, mean, I, 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 feel like, I feel like it's it's unfortunate, but it's, uh, not, it's not unfortunate, but it, I think it's true that um, while talent is important, um, uh, do I like you? Could I spend time working with you? Because we're starting onto a relationship mm -hmm. that could last, hopefully, weeks, months, years, as you write a book or you do a TV show. Do you make my life easier? And by easier, do you, at a minimum, follow those rules and guidelines? Right, that it takes for you're, we, we call it the, the rule of three. <laughs> I know, the, and, the, the, you know, if you, you can be two, you have to be two or three, you can be good, you can be fast or you can be cheap. You have to be two of those three things. So if you're good, fast, and easy to work with, then people will want to hire you. If you're not that good, but you're cheap and you're fast, and you're easy to work with. Funny, I, I was going to put talent as three, but I but no. cheap is also good. <laughs> cheap also, and, that, and that also is part of the equation. I'm sure you, you have who have been editors can speak to that. That yeah. um, even though it's art and what uh, the reason why we read comics isn't because they're made for a price, um, we read them because there's something passionate that oh, yeah. the artist and the writer has put onto the page. But at the end of the day, it's produced by um, a business, and it has to fit into that paradigm. So um, the cost of making it is a part. Here's a here's a question for you guys, and I don't mean to be painful about it, but. Uh, is there a time when you did mess up? And, you know, we know lying, you know, as soon as you get that. But, you know, sometimes you just have to fess up, you know? I mean, is there a time when, when you know, you handled something that, you know, could have been really bad, but you got through it? Yes. <laughs> yes, there are. This question, not to relive bad memories. <laughs> uh, well, I, no, so there were two. There was a time as an intern when I told a creator that his book was canceled before he actually knew that it was canceled. Because I thought, well, I thought he'd know. <laughs> so that was very early in my career. And I made the mistake. I apologized for the mistake. I was, I was in trouble. Uh, the second time, uh, it's not that I, there was a particular series I was working on. Uh, and I, 
the editor and I just didn't see eye to eye on a particular thing. And it's not that we cursed each other out, but we definitely got very heated in terms of like, you approve these things, we've drawn the pages, we have written the pages, the pages are now lettered and colored, and the book is ready to go to production, and you've stopped production because you, you want to change something so radically. So on a Friday night at 11 p.m., when the book was supposed to already have been at the printer, uh, I got into an altercation over email with the editor, and I probably should have let it go, but I was like, you approved everything, but you know, ultimately they weren't my characters, and I just let it go. But there was like that, that thing where it's like, you know, sometimes, especially because comics are a passion project, and some editors work very late at night, there are just things above your control that you can't just necessarily let go, because you're like, maybe I had plans that Friday night. But, mm -hmm. uh, maybe this, you did. It, maybe I did. But it's, it's, look, this is, comics is a very passionate thing. We all get very, sometimes we get possessive of our art or our stories or, you know, our books. Um, but at a certain point, you need to be able to, to let things go. And um, sometimes in the heat of a deadline, things can get kind of a little blah bitty blah and you can get like, really, uh, why can't this editor do this thing? Or, or as an editor, why can't this artist do this thing? But I think that um, you know, I eventually let it go, he eventually let it go, but there was that, that moment where you're like, oh my God, what is gonna happen? Like, are we gonna come to blows? Like, <laughs> I'm like what is gonna happen? Um, but you know, you just have to let it go. If you're working in corporate characters, you know, you have to understand that there are things beyond your control. Yeah. Yeah. I I had a, I don't tell this story very often, and I will change the names to protect the innocent. Yes. I think I know the story. Yeah, everyone, you, you everyone probably do. Know you do Every, this is probably a different story that you all. Every, also everyone know. start recording right now. Yeah. <laughs> I was uh, penciling a series that I had been wanting to pencil for a very long time. I had been really, was really excited and was going to be working with a writer who is considered a legend in various circles in, in comics. Especially their own? Yes. <laughs> um, I got the, the, the script for the first issue that I was going to do and it felt wrong. It felt like a reversal of everything that I knew, because I had been reading this series the entire time, collected the entire run of this series, actually. And it, he had already been on the book for several issues, and nothing seemed to make sense in the script at all. So I went to the editor at the time, who's no longer an editor, and uh, he agreed with me that something seemed to be wrong, but couldn't figure out what it was. So after the, a weekend had passed, I had gone into the office, and said editor said to me, they don't pay me to rewrite other people's ass. <laughs> I need That's you to fix this. Does this have anything to do with them not being an editor anymore? No, actually. He, he, he left to freelance, and he's now a very popular comic book writer. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Uh, That's a tough spot for you as an artist. It, right? it's a, it, well, well, first thing I did was I took the, 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 the end sequence of one issue, completely reworked it, Brought in, the page, uh, brought in the pages, and he said, none of, the dial none of the dialogue that we have lines up, we need you to rewrite the dialogue. <laughs> so I rewrote the dialogue for the entire, uh, for the entire sequence. Wow. So that was one issue. Went, went in, everything was okay. Next issue comes back, same issue. But this time, he says to me, I need you to rewrite the second half of this, of this entire issue, which I did. And I probably went in after I finished and said, I quit. <laughs> and he said, don't quit yet. <laughs> don't hold on. I did not know that this writer was going to be eventually taking over the book as the writer. Because uh... had I held on for three more issues, I would have been working with him directly. Uh... But wow. things, things worked out the way they did. But it was... The, 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 the biggest problem was, before we started working on, I had, I had a Skype meeting with this writer, 
and was very excited. And I, I basically fed him a storyline. I, I gave him an entire, I gave him an entire storyline that he promptly butchered and turned into something completely different than what we talked about for three hours. So. <laughs> It really is, but one of the real things about, about surviving is learning how to work with other people in a way that we're very passionate and creative, as David said. I always say one of the best movies about this is um, some kind of monster, which is the Metallica movie. Yeah. <laughs> and and it, if anybody's ever seen it, it's about where you know they've been apart doing their own thing, and now they have to come back together to make an album, but they're all so rich, and they're so... You know, the main guy's in rehab, and he can, his psychologist says, you can only be there for three hours a day to rehearse. And, you know, and you see these people, they're, they hate each other, and yet they're trapped <laughs> in this incredible, successful band, you know? And, it, and it's really fascinating. I've never seen anything that really talked about it. Because sometimes right. you do. Yeah. Sometimes you, get, you, you know, it is about personalities. It's about people you like working with, but sometimes you do have to, you know. Sometimes it's about people you hate working yeah. with. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like you, and that's yeah. professionalism. That's yeah. It. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Man, yeah, yeah. My, uh, <laughs> uh, I have a. Um, uh, it's not a comic story. It's a TV story. But it was uh, in this case, it was an interview, and um, uh, I really wanted to write on uh, a particular TV show that was the creation of somebody at the time who was probably the most successful writer producer in TV. Um, was doing a second series, was, I had just come off something, was very excited. Uh, but it was such a top secret project that they would not send the pilot script or the pilot mm. um, itself that had been shot for us to look at before the meeting. Instead what we had to do is go into the offices, watch the pilot in the conference room, and then take the meeting immediately after. Wait, wait, so you had to do a pitch? You had to walk into the office, watch the episode, and then immediately do a pitch for... Not, not so, it wasn't so much a pitch, it was really more like a, an actor. But of course I didn't really understand this, it was more like a get to know you, feel you out. Right, right, because right. Because they had read my work and they sort of had a sense of who I was. I had been recommended that I had been prepped for the meeting by the people at the studio who were running it, who said, um, ask a lot of questions, and this person is very private, mm -hmm. so um, no war stories. <laughs> so the two things are wrong. Ask a lot of questions, no war stories. So I went in and the pilot was based on some source material that was beloved and well known. Mm -hmm. And I watched the pilot and I, I hated it. <laughs> I, I, re I actively didn't like it and so I finished that and was immediately shown into the, to the room, sat across from somebody who I would say at the time was an idol of mine. Right. So not only was I nervous in the presence of that person who I greatly respected, but his lieutenants were there. So I literally had the entire writing staff of this amazing show and this new show all into me. And I couldn't, for the life of me, come up with great questions right. because I didn't relate, respond to the thing at all. And so in the kind of awkwardness that followed, what naturally started to happen was war stories. <laughs> so not only did I not address the first thing that I was told was going to make it a successful meeting, I right. violated the second <laughs> rule. And, and probably had I not violated the second rule, not having the good questions, I still might have got the job. But of course, if you haven't figured it out by now, I did not get the job. <laughs> now, it turned out the show was uh, went on the air and was canceled very quickly. Mm. So I think I was not the only one. I think you, the audience, voted with. So that ended up being your saving grace, anyway. I, you know, it. Uh, well, I would have loved working with that particular person. Right. I would not have ultimately had any. Uh, more success as a writer or in my career because I had right, right, right. Um, I might have had to go to TV jail. <laughs> oh, wow. So, but that's um, but but it's important. Every meeting has a has a series of things that will make it successful. And just like we've talked about in comics, where you know you sort of have the three rules of you know um, can I work with you? Um, you know, are you going to make my life easier? Mm. Um, are you talented and at the right price? Right. Um, also, 
you know, knowing what you're trying to accomplish when you go in. Because, you know, sometimes I was trying too hard. I was trying to get the job, be successful, uh, be the desired candidate as a writer all in one meeting. But, but sometimes all you need to do is make that first contact and that first impression and be patient enough to then follow it up with more contact in a way right. that serves the purpose. And, so. and yeah, you know, just, I mean, there are a lot of real basic stuff. I mean, you would be amazed. I mean, I, I was always hiring assistants, you know, at my various editorial jobs, and I would never forget when one person gave me a portfolio that was full of cookie crumbs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not the most, you know, neat person myself. I'm a bit of a pack rat, but I don't have, you know, food crumbs. You know? <laughs> so that was a non-hire. And he's a very smart, successful person, too. I mean, I'm sure he just forgot that he'd been eating a cookie <laughs> over his wow, portfolio. Wow, that is, that is insane. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think it would have been different if he actually had, like, a nice warm cookie for you. Like, yes, exactly. The there's a toll Maybe there was. <laughs> yeah, he just didn't make it to the... Did you, ever, did you ever tell them that that's You know, I never did. And, and you know what, I have to be honest, I, I did realize the person was was um, very talented, very smart, very capable, but, but he was a bit of a slob. You yeah. know? So that, I mean, if it had been the one thing... So, uh, so chances I, are there was no cookie in there? No, yeah. no, it was, it was a thing. Um, do we have any questions out here? I, I don't, you know, if anybody has questions for the panel? How, how many on. of you are burgeoning yeah. writers or artists? Yeah. All right, that's a pretty you good know. representative. But you gotta put your hand up. Come on, be confident. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what kind of things do you do? Do you do comics, fiction, TV, film? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I used to be a filmmaker. I've written, directed, produced seven short films, and I kind of burnt myself out, so I'm trying. You to should be sitting up here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to move on to trying to move on to graphic novels with some of my old old material. Oh, okay. You know, it's, it's interesting, um, I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but um, recently uh, there's been a lot of development of comic book properties going into television and film, yeah, especially yeah, in yeah. the creator own yeah. universe. But I also meet people who have television scripts, feature scripts, who, who want to go the other way. Right. That's actually a lot of my clients. Uh, yeah, a lot of people who are successful screenwriters who want to have um, their comics, to, to, uh, their film scripts, or their television pilots mm -hmm. adapted into comics because A, they love comics, and B, exactly that reason. Because they're like, well, I ha how can I get my pilot turned into something where I haven't gotten any traction on it? I know, I'll reverse engineer it. Right. I will turn my pilot into a comic, and then turn that <laughs> comic into a movie. Do it off mute, I think. And, and it's so so there you know, there are a lot of ways to uh, to approach that right. um, and reinvention you know I think in our in our parent in this par I was gonna say parents age in the stone age it, it was common that you would have maybe one job or one career for your whole life but now I don't think any of us I mean certainly we freelance we right. have different jobs different TV shows I think having multiple careers or different versions of yourself that's the norm. Oh yeah, no, there's definitely, you know, there's Jamal, the marketing director of Action Lab, there's Jamal, right. the writer, there's Jamal, the illustrator, there's Jamal, the storyboard artist, the guy who, who works for, you know, Samsung and Sony and, you know, whatever. So yeah, you're absolutely right. There's definitely you know, the multiple hats that I have to wear on an almost daily basis these days, you know. Well, Carl, you've actually written books, though. like. That is sort of your post comics, still comics career, right? Well, I have a very eclectic post comics career. <laughs> uh, I didn't get out of comics actually on a full time basis out of choice. Uh, the, I'd worked for Marvel for 13 years and uh, they got taken over by a corporate raider that proceeded to run into bankruptcy twice while they were in their pockets. So uh, eventually they went through rounds and rounds of huge layoffs. And eventually they told me they weren't going to renew my contract and I was out the door. Uh, so I, I decided I was going to be proactive and got into interactive. This would have been in '96, and I jumped into the one field that was more volatile than publishing. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I was creative director for a while at a massively multiplayer online gaming company while everybody was still on 28k modems, which was still ahead of its time. Uh, and then I was. Uh, 
senior creative director at. Uh, Did you ask which one? Yeah. Yeah. yeah which uh, which uh, uh, which MRP? Which uh, it was it was a company called VR One out in Boulder, and they did. Uh, games in all categories, but the, the 3D game that got the most, uh, it was on uh, Microsoft Zone for a while called Fighter Ace, which was a World War II flex sim combat mm -hmm. game. Sure. And then so, uh, in, Europe it was, in, in, in Europe it was called Air Attack. Uh, okay. and, and then we, we did turn-based strategy games too. It's one that's still, Steve Jackson bought it, still up on his site in permanent beta called uh, UltraCore. Okay. Oh, nice. Did that. But, uh, Adam became senior creative director at agency.com in New York and was working on things like Colgate Palmolive websites and <laughs> things like that. And, you know, if it's creative and, yeah, and problem solving and it's running a team, I like it, but it certainly was nowhere near as much fun as comics. And then I um, was pushing, I, one of the books I created for Marvel's creator own imprint called Epic was uh, Alien Legion. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd written, a, that was my first screenplay, I wrote that in 94. And it, Finally got optioned at Bruckheimer's in ninety in two thousand six. They had exercised the option in two thousand ten. Had half of Hollywood rewrite it, including David Benioff. He loved Alien Legion, so he fit in three drafts between seasons of uh, Game of Thrones. Then they, then they fired him. Uh, so I don't know if this thing's ever going to uh, get in front of cameras in my lifetime. You know, it's uh, you know two thousand six to now. It's quite a long time. So. And I've been, you know, doing that with some of my other intellectual properties, writing pilots or, or screenplays, and trying to uh, beat my head against the Hollywood machine. And it's it, it's tough because if you, you factor in, like, you know, you make a nice sale to something like Bruckheimer, but I wrote that script in '94. I didn't sell it. I optioned it, but I didn't sell it till 2010. Still, nothing's got done. If you factor in all the time and effort and the pitching, going out to LA, pitching all that. Effort, I don't think I made any money on this thing, um, uh, and uh, it's not an easy life. You know, you can make some money optioning things here and there, but if you factor in, you know, real all your your time and effort involved, it's uh, it's very there are very few people that I think can actually make a living out of that. Um, uh, but if you're passionate about it, you just do it anyway. Yeah. Well, I think in a way too that the passion helps sell the stuff. I've seen a lot of creators, especially at, at well, at, actually at a broad range of shows, who um, are you know behind the booth trying to sell their stuff, but they are spend too much time on their phones or not really paying attention, so they're not really engaged salespeople, they're not really engaged business people, and I think one of the things that I've learned in surviving as a comics creator is. Uh, making sure that I'm a smart business person and a smart sales person. So like I own, uh, I formed an LLC with you know my creative partner and- No, we, just let me jump into, that is when you create your own like uh, corporation, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's not that expensive. No, it was super cheap. Right, and now it's not for everyone, but right. it's a possibility. Yeah. Right. So, um, so we, so you know, our company is Bottled Lightning and we have, you know, four different IPs and um, we work with advertisers and partners and we make money uh, and we give all our stuff away for free and we make money through our ad partnerships and, and sponsorships that help us create content and we make it so that everybody can read it whether it's on our site or on Comixology or Tapastic or Noise Trade or Humble Bundle or whatever like we just do that but so much of where the mechanism that powers that being a smart business person. And one of the books I recommended on a previous panel that I uh, recommend to everybody who's interested in breaking into comics is uh, and surviving in comics is a book called Poor Craft. And it's yeah. all about how to, it's by uh, Spike Troutman. Uh, and it's so good because it really gives you the tools on how to have a career in comics, even if you don't have necessarily the resources or the financial wherewithal to to sort of you know do that. So many business comics people I know are bad business people. Don't follow that yeah. example. I, I, I actually had that my my slideshow worked. I actually had a point bullet point in there that was called fear of business. Because a lot of people do have an actual, you know, and I, I'm sure we've all had it, everybody here. Uh, has had that fear of the business, some aspect of the business where you just didn't want to deal with it and you put it off and put it off and put it off and then the longer you put it off, the more of a problem it became, right? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. We all know what I'm talking about. 
Um, but um, yeah. So um, yeah. Any, any more questions out there? Anybody? Anybody else? So uh, you know. Well, let me ask you. Oh, oh go ahead. You have a, on the panel here. I was going to just say when you're showing your portfolios to editors or other professionals to try and get feedback. Uh, I've seen a lot of portfolios and. Um, Sometimes uh, the reaction I, I get to my criticism, uh, taking back of it, you get some people who think they're God's gift and the fact that you don't recognize that, they take offense at, do not be that person. Yeah. Uh, at, try and be as open as you can. You often have to hear things you don't want to hear in order to get better. At the same time, you have to have your BS filter on because there are some people that will just talk like they know what they're talking about and they're full of crap, basically. I, I, there was a editor at Marvel who, I don't know how he got his position, but we used to have to look at portfolios together at cons, and he'd sit next to me, and I would just sit there and try and remember the name, uh, the faces of the people he was talking to. It's like a deep programming layer, because he had no <laughs> idea what he was He'd use catchphrases he'd pick out of mine and other, you know, uh, editors' dialogue to these people and use them out of context. Uh, that was really bad, but uh, so you have to have your BS filter up, but you also have to be receptive to hear the things you don't like. And if you ever run across people that believe in the, the new Kamal and like God sort of out uh, critique, uh, just say F off, because there are some people that uh, get their jollies by saying that, you know, I'm gonna tell this person to go dig ditches for a living, they'll never make it, and all this other stuff, because if they have what it takes, they're gonna say, I'm gonna, Show that SOB and teach them, you know, that they say that thing. And that that's says more about the person who's giving the critique than it does about you. It means they're basically looking for an excuse to be a bully. And if you run in, you know, if you're someone giving a critique and there's someone whose work is just really bad and very weak, you can tell them that in a nice professional way that's clear but not being abusive. And uh, so when you run into these people that, that, that do that, just keep in mind that it, it's saying more about them than it is about you. And uh, you know, if you're lucky, if you can grab some gem of information in there, that's fine, but usually it's just uh, them trying to be a bully. You know? I had, a, a couple weeks ago, I had somebody call me 100% failure as a creator and as a human being. Nice. So I certainly uh, understand what you mean. You're gonna hear people, you're gonna hear people who are gonna try to snark at you, try to make you feel bad, try to feel jealous about uh, where you are and where they're not. So you just have to be sort of mindful to not engage those people. And just, you know, if you hear a critique, certainly get better, but when it's filled with such empty nastiness and malice, just move past it and do the best work you can do. So speaking of Twitter, <laughs> so just, I, I, we're almost done, but just to wind up real quickly, uh, let me go down, I'll start with Jamal, just talking a little bit about, you know, survival, just in terms of social media mm -hmm. conventions, just, you know, like, how do you, how do you manage all those? Because there's so many conventions, you know, social media, like your, um, your outreach, in other words. Well, in general, my, my rule is never say anything online that you wouldn't say to somebody's face. Yeah. This, so, this is basically the truth. If I'm gonna, you know, I will happily call somebody an a-hole, you know, to their face, uh, if I feel like they deserve it. But <laughs> at the same time, because this is, uh, it is a professional arena that you're dealing with, but social media is not a completely professional platform. So it's sort of a, a cross uh, of objectives. You know, you're dealing with, you're trying, I try to comport myself as a professional at all times when I'm engaged with people on social media. It's not always possible, you know, I get angry about things too. Anybody who follows me online knows that I can be very, very passionate about a lot of different subjects. Yes. <laughs> well, you didn't have to say it like that. <laughs> but at the same time, I try, I try to be respectful, I try to be cordial, I try to and, you know, and to a fault, actually, before I go, you know, DEFCON 5. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, that's basically, and it's the same thing at conventions. You know, it's a, you know, this is my job, this is part of my job, is to come here, talk to you guys, I enjoy talking to you guys, I enjoy meeting, meeting people at conventions, 
for the most part, I enjoy traveling to conventions. Sometimes it's a pain in the butt, sometimes it's not. But you know, it's about treating everything equally, being professional in all terms, or at least trying to seem professional. That includes, you know, not passing out at the bar, you know, <laughs> after the show, you know, because you know the wor that's not the worst thing that can happen is you say something to the wrong person, and the next day you're wondering why you can't get work. Mm -hmm. you know, the best case scenario is you pass out and somebody writes, you know, penis on your forehead. <laughs> you know, the best means, case scenario? Well, yeah. It you know, means, it was, it means, it means <laughs> people like you. you know, <laughs> they like you, and, you know, they may not respect you, but they'll give you work. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 sort, I sort of feel like, um, uh, I, uh, and I'm certainly a new kid in comics and conventions, but um, I find, uh, and this is, I find this is true in TV and film, that um, two, the same, two, two people can uh, both like and hate exactly the same thing in your work. So I find that in interactions, whether it's social media or in person at conventions, um, if I feel like I can learn something from engaging, then I absolutely do it because I'm always looking to learn and you can always learn something new. But if I feel that I won't have the opportunity to learn something new, then, uh, then it's easy to just accept that either criticism or praise and leave it and let it be what it is. For me, I mean, I use social media. I mean, I like talking about myself, um, but um, because you know, I'm doing a lot of stuff, and I'm doing a lot of stuff digitally, and I want to drive people to check out my stuff. But more importantly, what I use social media as, more often than not, is a tool to empower other creators to get better. So I'm usually always online talking about, you know, retweeting other great creator stuff, whether it's Jamal's or Jeff's, or I know, or it's um, it's using the opportunities that I've had to empower other people to make great comics, and that's what I believe. Uh, that's what I believe is really the goal. It's like we want to create a really robust community. Why not do that and start that conversation on Twitter and continue that conversation at conventions and continue it in yeah. books and in, and in learning it? Because I want the next generation of comic creators to be better than me. Just not too soon. <laughs> Just not, too soon. not like tomorrow. So. <laughs> Give it a year. Um, I usually use as far as a. Uh, Professional stuff, I use uh, Facebook and Twitter basically to let people know if I'm going to be at a convention or giving a seminar somewhere. Uh, but uh, don't do the, the same mistake that I did. I, I was, I've got this giant mess on Facebook now where uh, it was all my personal contacts are mixed in with all these comics uh, uh, people, many of which are, are readers of my work. Uh, that I don't know personally, and now I'm trying to figure out how the heck to sort all that out and, and have several different uh, presence on, on Facebook without causing a, a giant mess, even a bigger mess. So, uh, you know, I would say from the start, try and separate the professional and the personal presence. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when I first started doing these talks, I would say, I don't have a MySpace page. So you <laughs> see how it evolves. Um, well, we are out of time, but thank you uh, for amazingly smart. And thank you for coming.